talk about, but I do want to make note of, is it's extremely difficult right now to come out of school. Extremely competitive, and the market is just not that great. So anything you can do to make yourself a value investment for somebody like me, Dow, or anybody else will certainly set you apart. So I can already tell you're on the right path, but that's my one little bit of wisdom. I work at Level. We're in Birmingham. I grew up in Foley, Alabama, if anybody knows where that is. I feel like I'm in the minority here, especially Alabama. It sounds like everybody's from out of state now. Um, but I grew up in Foley, home of Kenny Stabler, DJ Fluker. Julio Jones, um, so I'm glad to be uh, in that company, right? One other note is Shane Underwood is a very good friend of mine. We both went to Foley High together. Uh, Shane went from Alabama uh, with the highest scholarship here to Wharton to get his PhD, went to Rice University, and is now back here. So it's an incredible talent and resource for anybody that can access it. Um, Shane is fantastic. So I'm not a stock picker. I don't even know if I'd class my, classify myself as a value investor. So I know this is a value tilted conference. Um, what I would encourage you to do is listen to Dow very closely, know your circle of competence, but know also that you can pick your circle of competence. You're not forced to do anything. So even though most of academic preparation, I think, is sort of still geared to picking stocks, I want you to eliminate stocks from your vocabulary and just think of everything that's an investment as a stream of risk and return or an opportunity, right? That's really what it is, and don't limit yourself to think, I can only pick this stock here. Because we all have, if you really like this, you will be doing like Buffett. He's been extremely successful. He certainly doesn't have to work, but he loves it. And you can pick your circle of competence, and you know that in the space of 30 years, you can, all, you can embrace three to four reasonably well. That's why I asked that question. Is that you can engage in other things. If something is not working, find something else. Um, so how many of you have ever embraced the concept of when you're working, will you ever get fired? Everybody here, I think, as a student, I just thought I was the greatest. Um, and I, you know, I, I just never could get in my head. I never even thought about it, that I, I will be fired very likely. If you're entering into money management, it's guaranteed you will get fired. Buffett gets fired quarterly by investors through Berkshire, and even early in his career, he got fired multiple times. Seth Klarman, fired. Anybody gets fired, and if you read the big short or any of those things that came out of that CDS crisis, pay attention to how difficult those trades that we now know earn 5,000%, how difficult they were able to keep those trades on because their clients were telling them they didn't like it. And they were only losing 3 to 8%. In the scope of 5,000%, I'm willing to take 3 to 8% risk. So just know that. Um, so Anyways, I think <clears throat> value investing seems so easy, and in reality it is. But I started to think, why, so I'm going to try this, never done it before, why is something, this ain't going to work, so easy, so damn difficult. We are trained our entire lives to make purchasing decisions. Generally, what motivates us is a coupon in the mail. Something gets cheaper, we want to own it. If we wanted something a week ago, and then it's discounted 50%, you'd probably buy it. In the markets, it's exactly the opposite. Why is it the opposite? You get pressured by clients especially. But So my wife sends me this. We send our little boy to kindergarten with $10 of book fare money. Right? We anticipate him making a reasonable decision. If you notice his shirt, that's an Alabama shirt. But early on, peer pressure makes a difference. His best buddy is an Auburn fan. So not only did he make a bad decision about not spending his money on books, he bought that. <laughs> um, so just think, it, it's not, that's what makes it so hard. And if your buddy is able to influence you to do something, Think how easily somebody that's given you a million dollars, a billion dollars, can influence you to...
effect, they're paying you for your advice, but then they don't want it. It's similar to going to a doctor and thinking you need a medicine, telling that doctor you want that medicine, and the doctor saying no, it's not appropriate, side effects are too bad, whatever else, and then taking the medicine anyways. It happens all the time, it happens in money management also. So, very clearly, I'm sure you all all know that, but why is value this concept why does it work? Why do we even pay attention? Why are all the successful investors out there fundamentally value-oriented? If you think about the people that have made the most money in this space, they're value guys. So in 1992, Fama and French, I don't think you can read it, now cited by 10,309 other papers. That's pretty good, isn't it, Shane? Um, so if you notice these other ones, even these are fairly popular, but 514, 1,000, 10,000, it's clearly one of the most popular research articles out there. First of all, why did it not come about until 1992? Um, but then, um, why is it so popular? And what's beautiful about it is this data and everything that is, I'm showing you today, I did not pay a dollar for. So somebody asked the question about an internet, all of this, what I'm showing you, is out there. If you have an internet connection, which believe it or not, in 1994 when I started school here, they just started putting internet in the dorm rooms, in the labs. So it's not been that long, but now you have all of this stuff. The world's greatest investors, finance professors, at your fingertips. Use it wisely. So in 1956, what I like about the guy, one of the guys that wrote that article, Fama, you can see this is his essay. He started Markowitz, I'm sure you know that, 1952, 59, and Miller. Um, that's when he started to research this. And he didn't get a paper out until 1992. What's really interesting about that is the same time, 1956, Buffett started his first partnership. You know how much money Buffett started with? Mainly family money, $100,000, which then was a lot. Do you know how much Buffett put into that partnership? $100. So the thing about it is you ask any money manager what their dream is, it's to manage money for one client themselves because then you eliminate all those client pressures because clients make it difficult. So, 1956, Buffett starts out, by the time Fama publishes this now seminal paper, Buffett was the world's wealth wealthiest man. That's why academics, while it has incredible free research, they're generally a little bit behind. So pay more attention to the people that are trying to make money rather than people that are trying to prove something. So. Here's the paper, but it had already been pointed out that these things, that these efficient markets and everything else, and just by the way, if you believe in value investing, efficient markets do not make sense. Because if something is properly priced, there's no value. So there's a f fundamental disconnect. If you're gonna fully embrace value investing, there has to be some inefficiency that you expect to pursue. So here, all these anomalies had already started to be pointed out about valuations and how valuations can affect future returns. But again, 1992 was when this paper came out. He says, um, individuals did not seem to threaten the dominance of the model. My guess is that viewed one at a time, the anomalies seemed like curiosity items that showed that CAPM is just a model. But what he did, what he and Fama did, was in this paper to put everything in one paper where you could not make excuses about inconsistencies and anomalies. So like I said, go out and read this. Here's one of the things he finds three factors. They're now proving that they're more than three factors, but size, momentum, and value can help you earn excess return over the market. Because it's value, of course I'm gonna focus on that 
but know that the momentum part of that is one of the reasons why it's hard. When you're wrong, you tend to stay wrong. Sometimes for long periods of time, and that period of time is excruciating. I'm down this quarter. The market was up 6 to 10%. I'm up 0 to 3, and I'm feeling pressured. That's not a whole lot, especially when I want to be doing this for 30 years. I would hope that in a span of a couple quarters, I can make up 3%. If my decision to buy something right now is only because I lag by 3%, I'm not a value investor, and I'm not doing what my investors really want me to do, which is think differently, act differently, and find areas where things are improperly priced. But if things I think are improperly priced high, then I certainly don't want to buy them. Right? It's very simple. Buy low, sell high. If you're buying at a high, there's something potentially wrong with that notion. So how do, value op how do these opportunities come up? In a, small, in a small stock, in an undercover company, they pop up all the time. But what I want to, know, what I want to make sure I stress to you is that not only in s small, inefficient markets, they pop up across entire asset classes. An entire asset class, like the U.S. bond market, can have a return that is probably better than 99% of the hedge funds that have been ex in existence the last 30 years. They have a sharp ratio for the last 30 years better than Warren Buffett, the entire U.S. bond market. So not only does it in inefficient markets, but even extremely efficient, highly competitive markets, these opportunities develop. So that's why instead of me focusing on stocks, I think in my career, hopefully it's 50 years, that I will have four really good opportunities to make unbelievable amounts of money. And if you put it in that framework, it's much easier to resist 300 basis points, right? If I'm saying that I want to chase a return of annualized what, bond market 8.8% with a max drawdown of 5% for 30 years, then 300 basis points is just not, not even worth considering. So that's kind of the way I want to scope this stuff and why think about returns and value beyond just a stock and look for everywhere. And to get really good at it, do it. Just what if? What if the University of Alabama sold its football team? How much would it be worth? If you can figure that out, probably pretty easily figure out the opportunities that are in the market. So here is the data. It's completely free. Notice down here, Kenneth French has an entire data library. Um, that is available in text format that you can import into almost anything. I didn't even pay for Microsoft Excel to make this chart. There's a free open source stats program called R. If you want to learn it, it's fantastic. But here's the difference between value and growth, and it's a really rigid definition of value. It's just a price metric. It doesn't require me to spend five years to gain knowledge. All you do is buy everything that's this price or this low price compared to everything else. And $1 from 1926 turns into 22000 versus growth of 1800 Probably why we're talking about value investing today. Because if you multiply that 1 times 1000 you start with $1,000, you get $22 million versus one point eight. That's a lot. Or if you multiply it even further, it's a whole lot of money. So that's why value investing and even just the notion of it is extremely helpful. So here's some other stats um, just to prove it. Value is slightly riskier, which most people don't know. has a higher standard deviation. But broaden your concept of risk. Standard deviation is not how much money you might lose. 
drawdown and what Dow calls permanent loss of capital is what you lose. I don't care if I own something that goes up and down 5% every day if all the 5% down days are followed by a 5% up day. Who cares? And occasionally I get a 10% up. That's a really good investment. What I do care about is if there are multiple down 5% days in a row because after 10 I'm down 50% and it's exponential from there. It's very difficult to make it up. So back to why is it so hard? You look here, actually value got clobbered during the depression. Worst drawdown and a much longer recovery. It really didn't start to prove itself until right there. So if you're not in 1992 looking at this data, growth would have been the place to be. But then you start to see the compounding effect and how over time it works better. But value really separated itself here, mid-70s, primarily by not losing as much. It's that margin of safety concept. That if you have a margin of safety, you expect those multiple standard deviation down days to be buffered. You expect them to stop. So again here, 2000, um, Less drawdown in the tech bubble, but where it gets very interesting is in the last one. It ruined some of the best, Bill Miller, et cetera. Value got hit most because much of value was comprised of finance. Finance got obliterated. So again, in hindsight, this is very easy. Buy, buy low price stocks, sell when um, never sell. Um, so here you can see rolling five-year returns. Here's where value starts. This is a darker blue. I know it's probably hard to see. Value does better here. Here was the most excruciating time probably in this entire time period to be a value investor. It was in the tech bubble. And not only did you lose one year, you lost about five years in a row by things that we now know are ridiculous, but not only that, things that all of us knew were ridiculous in 1999 when I came out of school. The hard part about making a decision and investing is not being right. It's being right at the right time. Right? Everybody knew that tech stocks were overvalued. There was no, as much as people, intelligent people, rationalized away why we were doing stupid things, you still know it's stupid, right? But if I would have come out four years earlier in my college career, it would have been very difficult to look a client in the face and say that's stupid because it's missed money. But again, put it in the framework of is this opportunity so compelling that I would risk my job over it, right? If I only have four really good opportunities my entire career, is this one of them? I hope not. Um, one little silly notion I like to tell people is I'd rather make less money and have a longer career than make more money in a shorter career. Right? And any good investor, any good asset manager hopefully will tell you that same thing because it requires an incredible amount of patience. So just a little more here. I don't know if you can see it. This is institutional flows. I couldn't find the data on mutual funds, but this is in terms of stocks. You can see that it's fairly cyclical. I can't remember. The lowest book to market is the highest price. So that's here. All the money is going into growth. Very likely, you would have gotten fired every quarter by somebody that felt like you were stupid when you know that everybody else is stupid. Right? I'll, I'll, I'll get back to all that. Well, Seth Klarman, who wrote Margin of Safety, I think everybody's aware of. But his book goes, it's out of print now, it's publicly available. But even then, people are willing to pay $1,500 or $2,500 for his book, even though you can get the PDF out there. He has a great quote. I'll save it for later. So here is that notion that was hard is the younger you are, generally, you should be more risk tolerant, 
right? You should be more aggressive because you have plenty of opportunity to recover. But you also have the least amount of confidence in yourself and you have no track record to operate on. So people are very easily, will very easily discount what you think. Being older does not mean anything in the finance industry because luck and skill is very difficult to extract. You can make a lot of money over 10 years and just be lucky. Not even know what you're doing. But in your mind, after a 10 year run, you think you're the best in the world. You just missed a very simple assumption. So don't pay attention to people that have been successful 10 years. Pay attention to people like Buffett that have been successful 50. Klarman that's been, I think he started his fund in 83. At this point, I think he's proven himself. But look at the data. We have all this data available back to 1800. It's not real reliable. Data on the US is very clearly available from 1920. Um, so use that, but also know that the US is an anomaly, right? I say it all the time, if you tell me who the country is that will be the U.S. over the next 150 years, I'll buy it with as much leverage as I can get, and I will ride it. I don't like to make hard decisions. The fewer decisions I make, the more likely I am to be right. It's just probability. If I say stocks are going up or down and it's 50%, either way, one in two chances I'm going to be right. But then I say that Finance companies are going to be up or down, 50% chance. It's 0.5 for the first decision to be right, 0.5 for the second to be right. You know, real mathematics majors will say I'm missing something there. But 0.5 times 0.5, I'm now one in four chance of being right. I want the odds with me as best as possible because none of us can predict the future. If we could, we wouldn't be sitting here. We don't know what's going to happen to me in five minutes. So just know that our business is a business of failure. And I know that all of you probably have A's or better. Think about that in a test. You probably start to feel uncomfortable if you think you've missed one question on a 20 question exam, right? Have you ever sat in an exam and missed 20 questions? You probably feel like a huge failure. Well, in an investment space, what would you say is your probability of being right on every decision you make? Alan? Uh, I think if you, get half, if you get half decisions right, you're doing pretty well. Think about that. So put it in the context of a test. If you miserably fell on a test, that's what your rest of your life's going to be like. Get used to being wrong and embrace it. Learn from it and do better the next time. Doctors don't get the chance to be wrong 50% of the time. Lawyers don't, accountants don't. So enjoy it, <laughs> right? But look at this, what happens is that peer pressure, the client pressure, career concerns of mutual fund manager, termination, uh, I've never heard this before. There's some termination performance relationship. It's a pretty nasty way to describe it. Um, is more performance sensitive for younger managers. The shape of the relationship may give younger managers an incentive to avoid unsystematic risk. And the incentive to herd, because you don't have this mindset that Buffett has, after 50 years, he does whatever the hell he wants. And if somebody doesn't like it, he doesn't care. We don't get that opportunity when you're 21 and somebody says, do this. But resist it. Peer pressure is not something that you want to succumb to if you're doing your job right. So this incentive to herd is hard not how it's hard to resist. But it's incredibly hard right when you start. So that's a one the other one is this one, which is pretty good. Somebody uh, or Dow suggested you look at Morningstar for the best. Uh, mutual fund managers, this paper is better than Morningstar. Because um, not only does it do that, it traces all of the managers and how long their career was. 
So we look here, and let's see if this works. The best 50 solo managed funds, Peter Lynch leads the group. There are a bunch of others that you probably heard of, but there are a lot that you haven't heard of. Go find their mutual fund, go find their annual report, go find their filings, and figure it out how during their first three years, they earned 8.27%. That's a lot. That's above and beyond the market. It's a, I've never heard this either. It's a market-adjusted cumulative annual return. So if the market went up 8%, these guys, their first three years, every year, or on average, earned 8.27% better than the market. T-STAT, 5.79 for the stats geek, which is significant. Right? Do I have my stats right? But look at these people that only lasted three years. They don't, we don't know if they got fired or quit, but I can tell you that this little bitty 1.3% got them fired or forced them to give up. You need to be more resilient than that. You need to look somebody in the face, but you also need to do the research to give you the confidence you're not making a decision because you think. You're making a decision because you know as best as you can with 50-50 probability. But you know that you're doing the right thing. You also know that every day the market is open and if you realize you're wrong, you close the position. Right? But that's something that's sad because that could just be luck. If you were a value manager in 1997, you would have underperformed by 20% a year. In theory, you're right. But you might have gone on to do something, you might have gone bad groceries or something. If you really love it, stay in it. Just, just keep going. So here's the chart of it, which I, I can find much better. Here's the little guys that didn't last. Here are the guys that did incredibly well. Figure out what they did because it's a 20 year career. It's hard to be lucky for 20 years. Um, but you see this whole subset here lasted 20 years or more and never ever had that great a return. So how do the world's best not pick stocks? How do they resist this pressure? Everybody wants to know how Warren Buffett picks a stock. Even Warren Buffett, what, 60% maybe at best on the investments he makes? Even Warren Buffett. Not, don't pay attention to just how he picks stocks. Figure out how the hell he resisted the temptation to do something stupid just because his clients or somebody else told him to. Right? So, all right. 2012, they're finally starting to figure out, what is that, 56 years later, why Warren Buffett was successful. How does it take 56 years to figure out what he figured out 56 years ago with very little data? What did he do? All right. His Sharpe ratio was 0.76. Most people, most mutual funds love to claim a Sharpe of 1, 2, 3. If you have a sharp ratio of one, two, or three, I think over 30 years or more, you then become like 50% of the market. You can't do it. It's impossible. The world's wealthiest man, starting with $100 in his first partnership, had a sharp ratio of 0.76. Know that as your benchmark. Don't be naive enough to somebody, we have conversations all the time, right, Alan? What's your sharp ratio? We don't have that conversation, but in effect, it's that pressure from other managers. Not only do you, are you, do you look stupid to your friends and family, to your clients, but you look really stupid to the people you respect in the industry. So it's tough. Just know that this business is tough, but that's what makes it fun, right? If something was easy, it wouldn't be nearly as fun. So what I always like to say, When's the best time to figure out you should not be on a roller coaster? Because when you're most scared is not the time to exit. So make that decision now. Know that is extraordinarily difficult, it is extremely unpleasant, 
But that's why I want to do it for 50 years. I'd get incredibly bored if I had it all figured out. If Warren Buffett had it figured out, he would have quit a long time ago and done something else. So, all right, it's very simple. He boosted his returns with leverage. Who knows Warren Buffett is leveraged? He certainly won't tell you that. Through the structure of an insurance company, he had about implied leverage of 1.6. Very simple advice. He's very good at communicating it. These guys were even better. Stuck to a good strategy for a very long time period. That's pretty easy, theoretically. Surviving rough periods. This is where it gets tough. Where others might have been forced into a fire sale or a career shift. A career shift is you either get fired or you give up. It's not pleasant. They make it sound okay, but it's not that great. He buys stocks that are safe, cheap, and high quality. How did it take 56 years for people to figure this out? I don't know. I wish I would have figured it out. Remember, I'm getting pressure from my clients for underperforming by 3% from a benchmark that I, even, that I shouldn't even be compared against. 1998 to 2000, Buffett lost 44%. Warren Buffett loses money? Yes, all the time. 44%, which I don't even accept as an option for me. I would be extremely disappointed if I lost 44%. When the market went up 32%, I'm feeling pressure at 3%. He lost 76% compared to the market. That's a big gap to confidently tell a client early in your career, I know what I'm doing. You know, at this point in his career, he doesn't care. But he came back and is doing much better. So they finally figured out the factors. 2012, this is the uh, same authors of this paper. Uh, they work at AQ, one of the guys works at AQR, uh, Cliff Aston, that's his big hedge fund. Read him, he's extremely good. Uh, betting against beta, low volatile stuff, quality minus junk. What's crazy about this? In summary, if anybody used what we now know we can put in a formula and had the structure that Buffett put in place, you could end up the world's wealthiest male or female. But think of not how he chose those stocks because the formula can get you there. Think of what he did that allowed him to continue to do what he knew ultimately would work. Again, he doesn't have the data that we have. So think about that. The way he did it, the most glorious thing, is his clients are not asking him to manage their money. His clients are paying him for insurance. So all he needed to do really was keep his AAA rating and he could lag by 76% and people are still going to buy insurance from Geico because he's AAA rated. So think about it. He's not even a money manager in the sense that I am or Allen or CT or Dow are. He's an, he runs an insurance company. He didn't at first, but that's where he made his money. It was the structure. So not only did he ha uh, remove a lot of that pressure on the investments because he runs a company, he chooses who invests. It. Pretty simple. He got embedded leverage of 1.6 uh, times, and he had a cost of funding. I didn't show you this. A cost of funding of negative 3% to the U.S. T-bill. For him to get leverage cost him less than the U.S. government by 3%. And right now the U.S. government bars at zero. I wish I could get that rate of leverage and I could actually maybe apply it, but that's from when he started running the insurance company. As a little exercise, I did this. Um, I did produce this in Excel, so it cost whatever. Um, I, I want to disclaim that. This is Buffett. I'm going to the point of this article was sort of in theory, if this were your manager in 1974, would you fire him? Anybody, any one of my clients probably would have fired me. He underperformed the S&P by four years, and his loss was 
1974 versus the S&P of 25. But here's where you start to see his genius. And I don't want to discount that he is a genius, but he's not a genius stock picker. He's a genius in figuring out all this other stuff. He starts to get it here. Now, this article is in 98, but I have to think he had this. How many people, if it was so easy to pick out Warren Buffett and it was so easy to follow him, why aren't all his original investors just extremely wealthy? How many of his original investors actually made what we would consider a lot of money? I guess less than 10. Um, because they all fired him. They thought he was crazy, he underperformed by 70%. What the hell are you doing? So here, I don't know if you can read it, you couldn't get my Aunt Katie to sell if you came at her with a crowbar. And then we look at this next thing, and this is a really good article. I was president of CFA Society of Alabama last year. Get your CFA. Do it. It's cheap. It's a value. If you have to choose CFA or over MBA, I'm going to get shot. Do CFA first get your experience, and then you can decide if you want an MBA later. So I did have to pay my fee for CFA to get this interview. Jason Zweig, this guy right here, anytime you see something, he writes almost every day in the Wall Street Journal. At least read them once a week. Journalists um, aren't the best source of information. But he is. He's extremely good. He understands his behavior uh, difficulty. Um, so he says, and I figured I already, he asked the question that I would wanted because what interested me most about the big short and what was the other one? Greatest trade ever or something like that was I was intrigued by how Michael Burry and John Paulson were literally days away it seems like from having to sell their CDS a month before they made billions. Not little bitty money, I'm talking about billions of dollars and how close they came to having to sell that. So he says, how do you resist that? How have your organized bot posts, and I don't know if I pronounced it right, to discourage your clients from putting you in a similar position? We have great clients. Having great clients is the real key to investment success. People are paying $2,500 for the month margin of safety. This is what's important because if you think about what gets you really wealthy, not just slightly better off, not just comfortable, what gets you really wealthy? There are four real ways. There's a guy, Ashvin Chabra, who wrote Wealth Allocation Framework, has four ways. One is you use other people's money and your own money and you build a business, you reinvest all your proceeds for 30 years. At the end of the 30 years, you sell it and you're wealthy. The other is real estate. You use the embedded le leverage characteristics, but also other people's money to make money like Sam Zell. Sam Zell is very entertaining and extremely bright too. If you want to read somebody outside of stock picking space, read his stuff. The other is you manage other people's money, just like what we're trying to do. Um, but in theory, to make it work, you need other people's money. So the idea, my first reaction to this was just say, fire all your clients. But then you're left with whatever's in your wallet. At 22, at 35, I don't have nearly enough money to really get there. I don't know if I ever really want to get there. I'd feel very blessed to have a career where I get people better off than where they would be without me. But if I do that, I think I'll be successful. How much money I end up with, I don't know. I don't really care. I'd like to be comfortable is all I know. So that's the most important factor. He doesn't say picking the right stock is the most important factor. He doesn't say using value investing or growth or this or that. The real key to investment success is figuring out, first of all, how to get clients money. Second of all, how to keep it in an extraordinarily difficult space where you're best 60-40, right or wrong. So that's what, and I hope I don't sound negative. Again, that's why I wake up every morning. That's why I love what I do. Um, 
But that's, that's it. Um, I, just know that it's tough. And know that you're going to be wrong a lot. And just get used to it. You know, what I've witnessed in, I had not been in the markets that long, but the people that are smartest blow up the fastest. Because they're so used to being right, they don't know what to do with, when they're wrong. And instead of accepting that they're wrong, learning from it, and going to find another opportunity, they sit there and they justify their actions. It's that confirmation bias. It's hard to learn because you don't want to point out the stuff you don't learn. Dow said it, I will say it, you, if you want to manage money, I don't know any money manager that doesn't read absurd amounts of stuff. But just reading doesn't do anything. You need to comprehend it, you need to be able to teach it to somebody else, and you need to be able to put it all together to make a very difficult decision. Just as a reference, just for this, I probably looked at, I'll underestimate, 50 research papers at about 40 pages apiece. It's 2,000 pages just for this. And I still didn't feel really comfortable with what I was going to say. So that's, that's my bar. When I make an investment decision, again, a really hard investment decision where I think it's one of those four chances where I will make me and my clients a ridiculous amount of money. I should be able to write at least one book, probably two on that concept. Because those type of opportunities take a long time to develop and for me to be able to bet enough on that decision, I'd have to be extraordinarily confident. And I don't take managing my own money lightly. I certainly don't take managing other people's money lightly. When I say it is time to go, when Seth Klarman calls up his clients and he says it's time to go, I want to have the confidence to be able to tell them why we're doing it and give me all your money and it's a leap of faith. But if it works, it will work brilliantly. That to me is success and that's why I wake up every day. So that's all I got. But um, I won't draw, I was going to draw pretty pictures and stuff, but I'll stop there.